Ah, bifocals, bring it in. Yes. <laughs> hey, we had some real slippery fellas come through Sanford since you left, but you're the first legitimate magician. <laughs> the first, oh, legitimate magician, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I went to school with, and Herb, yeah. you're, he came to my house one time in 1961 or two or something and borrowed my cape for a special Halloween party. You know, I had a beautiful full-length Inverness cape. And he went as a musician. And, and, he? and he bought it. And, and, and he said, I'll bring it back in four or five days. And he really did. I figured, you know, my cape might disappear. But he really, <laughs> he did really bring it back. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like her. And, uh, oh, he, 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 he had pictures taken. He, I never got the picture he promised me. But I liked her very much. And, and Frank I went to school with and, and all that. And I'm glad to see some of you guys that I know. Yeah, and Buddy Lake. See, I have a problem with Buddy Lake and Bob Brown talking. The audience is talking. I was going to start sometime this morning, Robert. You got this here. Go ahead. Now, the thing is, I always had a problem with Buddy Lake, which he never realized. Because I'm a boy like 12 and 13 and 14. Buddy Lake's our local hero, the yes. man, the baseball player and all. <laughs> I had a, a baseball actually autographed by Buddy Lake, which somebody stole. I had it till I, from the time I was 12 till I was 16 or 17, and somebody really stole my Buddy Lake baseball. But was it? Anyhow, Buddy Lake was the local hero. I'm 12, 13, 14, 15, kind of envying him and all. Like everybody looked up to him, and everybody talked about Buddy Lake all the time. And, so I say, I, I wasn't into sports, you see. I was not into the, to the athletics. But time I'm 15, my mother and dad take me to a magic show at the Ritz Theater. And here I say, aha, this is what I want to be and this is what I want to do. This was 1950, April 19th, 1950. <clears throat> Michelle, please settle down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Anyhow. Walking home that night, I tell my mother, now, this is what I want, I want to be that handsome man and that beautiful tux, those beautiful girls on either side. Come to find out later, it was the man's wife and his sister-in-law, the family show. See, well, I didn't know all that. So I said, I'll go into magic. So I started answering all these ads in, in little Lulu comic books. Send 35 cents, get our magic catalog. Send 50 cents, get our magic catalog. Here's the line that got me. Be the life of the party. That did it right there. Be popular. Learn magic as a hobby. Be the life of the party. See? So I said, well, if I go into magic, I can be popular. I'll be the life of the party. I'll be a hero, something like Buddy Lake. See? <laughs> this was all in my, the whole time, see? So mother and dad and I sat on the front porch, and we talked it over and everything. So they backed to me. They really did. I had good parents. They backed me and said, okay, here's what we'll do. We made the plan. I'll start painting houses with my dad and sending all my money. Every two weeks, send all my money to magic shops in Chicago and Wynwood, Pennsylvania and all over to get props and all. Okay, so I'm now 16, 17 years old, 18 years old. Luckily, when I'm 18, I get to play the grammar school right across the street from my house and the Ritz Theater the next night, all October 30th and 31st, 1953. So now I got my couple of fees, $20 at the grammar school and 50, ah, 50 bucks at the Ritz Theater, see? I know now I'm, I'm just, I'm on the threshold of stardom. But it's all these years later, it's now 1997. I've been all over the United States, 44 of the states and Canada. Seven big tours and three Canadian tours. And I've done all this and I come home four, five weeks, six, eight, 10, 11, 12 weeks a year and I'm in and out and all. All these years later, not only have I never been invited to a party, <laughs> to be popular at, I, I haven't been a hero either. And, and late at night, sometimes it kind of bothers me a little bit. And then last night, I'm turning out my light from reading a couple of ghost stories. Edith Wharton, the best writer in the world, writer of ghost stories and classical romances. I'm reading Edith Wharton, I'm turning out my light, and I have it hit me. What? I'm going to do a little act and show and everything at a museum. A museum <laughs> is for old things. <laughs> This, this hit me at 2 o'clock this morning, but anyhow, here I am. I don't know where to start. I never know where to start. I used to be into hypnosis. I know most most people don't realize that magicians, most of them take up hypnosis as kind of a hobby. I'm going to hypnotize a piece of rope. 
Have, have, have you got me there? I got you. I'm going to hit. This is great. This is phantasmagoric in concept, a veritable sorcery miracle. Watch carefully. Don't you love the vocabulary? Yeah. Huh? 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 <clears throat> hypnotize the rope. You see, we we hypnotize <laughs> the <rope>, see. <laughs> I'll say one thing, you pay attention to this. <laughs> we hypnotize the rope and make it stand straight up. We make it rigid, the rope is rigid and stand. <laughs> Don't worry about that. That's all part of the act. That's just the part I didn't rehearse. The part I didn't rehearse. <laughs> <clears throat> These are the laugh lines, girl, laugh. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> We're buddies, I can tell. <clears throat> now, the rope is standing rigid, straight, rigid. Ah. Oh, heck, well, here. How about that? Pretty good, huh? <laughs> it's not so good? Well, I'll tell you what, then we'll just... Oh, my goodness. Well, you've seen that one, anyhow. That's enough of that. Now, let me see here. I have all kinds of things to do with rope and... What in the world? Wait a minute. Two purple and a yellow... Two purple and a yellow scarf, or would that be a yellow and... Uh, there it is. That looks better in the middle, don't it? Huh? 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 Does that look better in the middle, young lady? Hmm? See, it's not too, it's now the, never mind. <laughs> we might want this later, I don't even know. Oh, that's the magic fan. I know. Oh, and the magic wand. This is one of the first things I ever learned. This is called the levitate, look at the levitated, the levitated wand. Isn't that absolutely, white? It's, I've never understood how that works. <laughs> I had my buddy the other day, Charlie Lundquist, try to tell me how it works, and, and I've never understood it. But anyhow, and then we have the rising wand, you see. That <laughs> you don't know whether to laugh or not, do you? <laughs> laugh anytime you want to, except when I'm being serious, which is not very often. Only usually during divorces is, is what I'm serious about. Anyhow, let's see. Okay, uh, we have a scarf. Oh, yes, indeed. This one. You know, it's a funny thing. Rope I find very versatile for a magician because it's, uh, well, you can do almost anything with rope. And uh, I learned something a while back that, that uh, well, here, tell you what. Young lady, you help me with this one, will you? Would you hold the one, please? You, you remain seated. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do is make the knot here like this, and then would, would you, now you hold the one a little higher because I'm going to need you to tap my hand. Would you, would you take that end of the rope? Young man, you lean forward and take this end of the rope right there. That's fine. Remain seated. I want the camera to pick this up. It's a virtual miracle and sorcery. Tap the hand three times. Well, let's go over here to the hand, too. The rope's fine, but let's do the hand, too. That's fine. Now, see, say the magic word, imperatus. Well, hocus pocus. Now you got it. Now just pull, pull slightly, pull slightly, because what we have here, see, is what we call no knot. You see, huh? 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 It's, it's called no knot. Thank you, young lady. You take things awfully seriously yourself, don't you? I can tell. Okay, now, now you're going to help me with another one, because, see, if you loop a rope around a thumb like that, there's no way that rope can, I mean, if you try to pull that rope down through that thumb, you could lose a thumb, you see. We don't want to do that, so what I'm going to do is loop it around and do two things so you'll know here. Would you hold the rope for me right there? Now I'm going to take this hand and put over the top of the thumb. So when you pull the rope and it passes through the thumb, you can tell it does not pass over the thumb, but through the thumb, okay? On the count of three, I want you to pull the rope right through the thumb. One, two, three. How about that? And I didn't even lose a thumb or anything. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> now, I don't know if you had a... A lot of the kids call this... Uh, well, I call it short, medium, and long ropes, but... A lot of the kids actually call it mommy, daddy, and baby ropes. So that's all right, I guess. But the enigma here is, if we had or have three ropes, we'd have six ends. Now here's where it gets confusing. Three ropes and six ends. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six ends and ten fingers, you see. Now I'm going to have to make a magical incantation like uh, six Semper McGinnis. That does it every time. 
Then we take the three ropes and we kind of pull and grunt and tug and fuss a little bit. And when we get done, we should have three about the same length. There's one, two, three. I'm not sure about that. Let's double check. One, two, three, the same length, and the miracle is done. <laughs> now, I don't know. I'll tell you the truth. With, uh, oh yeah, I almost forgot. We have these. The rope is, is very good for a magician because you can do so many things. If we had a couple of ropes that were tied together and all, now watch carefully because I'm going to need my magic wand on this one because they're supposed to kind of link or loop or pass together. Now that's, that's all right, but here I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to go one, two, three, and uh, this one should meld or melt. I don't know here. Let's see here. Oh yes, there we are. Now, the thing is, if we get them all together like that, we should be able to, uh, I don't know, let's, let's see here. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to have you do, young lady. Would you take the wand? You know this one, this girl this time, your sister right here, yep. And you tap, you tap the ropes for me. Will you do that? That's good. That's good. You're imbuing the ropes with mystical powers. Now, hold tight, hold tightly, because I'm simply going to count. And that should be one, two, and three. Give this girl a nice round of applause. <laughs> now. I don't know. There's, there's so much, there's so many things. Would, would uh, I tell you who I more really would like to have come up and help me this time? This gets technical now. This one, this one gets heavy. Uh, would Michelle come up and help me? <laughs> Michelle of the museum here. Michelle, they say if you give a magician enough rope, he'll hang himself. <laughs> and, and I'm about to prove that. If we have a nice big long piece of rope and a pair of scissors, I know you've seen this. You've seen it on TV or maybe you've seen it in person. So take the rope about in the middle, which they say you'll find right around the center somewhere, and then we cut the rope right in two, just like that. I want you to cut the rope for me, Michelle. And then step over this way, please, so, so we're not in the way of the brief. Go ahead and cut the rope for me. Because then, after you cut the huh? <laughs> the, the scissors don't open? Mm. No, Michelle Mullins. What you do is take it like that, see, and just go. <laughs> just oh. like that. All right. That's good, Michelle. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> isn't, isn't she sweet? <laughs> I got it. No, oh. You got it? You're the only person in history to ever get it. Give me those silly things. <laughs> I'm going to do it with this pair because they cut so good. I don't believe you did that. <laughs> That's almost embarrassing. <laughs> now, with the rope all cut in two, you see, you know what the object is, to make the rope back together in one piece again, right, Michelle? Now, if we make the rope back together in one piece, and here it's done. It's all back together, huh? huh? Oh, What's your problem, young man? <laughs> and yours, too, I can tell. There's consternation in the troops here. Well. It looks funky with the knot in the center, so don't worry about that. We'll gather, we'll gather the knot right up like this, okay? And once we gather the knot up, then we'll just say, hocus pocus. Okay, that always does it. And the rope falls out restored with, with the, <laughs> we're still funky, huh, Karen? Okay, i tell you what, now Michelle, get ready. This is, Michelle, don't, don't, now, now, Michelle, I need your help this time, okay? All right. What we do is take the fan, Michelle, and we fan the rope like this. The agitation of the fan actually, well, here, here, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and give it a try, will you? Because what we, no, no, Michelle, no, no, Michelle, no, not like that, Michelle, no, 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 see, that's funky like that, no, what we want to do is go like this, so we fan it, you see, okay? There you are. If you get that one, girl, I'm going to just shoot myself. <laughs> you won't open that fan, will you? 
I want it to look like a crippled windmill, and you're not cooperating at all, are you? Okay, okay, here it is. This time, it all falls, it's if, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, we are having a, having a problem. <laughs> i tell you what, I'll just take the old scissors, and we'll just uh, remove the knot, which is the cause of the problem, okay? This time, the rope falls out, completely restored, and there's, well, don't worry about the little kink in the middle. That just pulls right out, so everything's fine. And thank you, Michelle. I don't know how to thank you, Michelle. You may be seated, Michelle. She's ready to go. I can tell she's had enough of me way back there. Yep. And now, let's see, maybe one or two... We've got two boys sitting down here that look anxious. i tell you what, guys. If we had a scarf, here's what I want you to do for me. I'm going to take this piece of rope and loop around the hand this way, and then this way, and then this way, and then this way. Uh, but if you would, Flo, please, take the scarf and run under the, the loops there, and about to the center, tie the scarf on the ropes. Okay, that's good. That's very good. That's good because this. Now, guys, stand up here with me. If you are one on the other side. Okay, you take this one. You take this one, sir. That's good. That's good. Everybody can see fine. All right, you got this on camera, right? Got you. Okay. Now, mm. guys, I don't know how to say this except on the count of three, give the ropes a pull. Now. <clears throat> When you pull the ropes, what's supposed to happen is the rope will pass or dissolve or melt right through the hand and the scarf, leaving the knot in the scarf. It's a very nice delusion. I don't call it an illusion. It's more of a delusion because you think you're seeing what you're not seeing at the time. Do, do either one of you understand that? I don't think so. I don't either. I lost myself way back there. Anyway, inconsequential rhetoric covers a lot. Yeah. You'll learn that in life. Now, <clears throat> watch carefully. Now, guys, when you pull the rope, if, if it tightens around the hand and the hand starts turning purple, give me a little slack. Okay, okay. In other words, if it don't work, give me a little slack. All right, okay. all right. On the count of three, and let's see what happens. One, two, three, pull. That's good, that's good. Through the hand and scarf with the knot that flow tied still in the center of the scarf. And thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> Guys, you may be seated. And thank you for your help. <clears throat> I have something now that I'm, uh, this, this gets a little difficult. Well, I'll show you. This is what we call the magician's knot, you see. And it, of course, dissolves. I'm going to show you how the magician's not done and always help the magician. This will be the last experiment in magic this morning, and I need this lady's help back there. If you'll come right up, I believe it's Irma, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is, from, from Quitman, Georgia. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Irma. Irma, if you would please, take the one and hold in front of you like that, okay? And, and, uh, lock, it, lock it in the other hand. I want it, and, and you got to lock it down. Okay, now step over here, all right, and come over here with the one more like this. That's just right. That's pretty good. Now, if I put the scarf here like this, Irma, you see, and tie the, the knot there, the magician's knot. See how it dissolves but loops, loops around, loops around the magic wand. I know, and I, I can tell you understand and, and all that now. Here's what I'm going to attempt, and this takes concentration. We're going to loop it around, tie it around, then tie a square knot or granny knot or uncle knot or whatever you want to call it in front. But now I have to concentrate because here's what. <laughs> what are you laughing at? This is the one I told you yesterday. Okay. Later, when people come up, you say, "How did he do that?" You're not going to be able to tell them. <laughs> You better not tell them. Okay. <laughs> I have to concentrate here. Let me, let me get, there we are. No, 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 no. 
not, not at 62, but there. <laughs> Hocus Pocus, Imperatus, Six Semperman Genus, Buttermilk and Bones, and the Cat Bit Off the Pump Handle. The Pump Handle. Well, that dates me, doesn't it? Watch, watch carefully. The scarf will pass right through the wand that Irma is holding, pass, melt, or dissolve right through the wand, and, uh, well, it should. Oh, there it is. <laughs> With the knot still in the center of the... And you're still holding the wand, and thank you, Irma. You may be seated now. Here, Irma, nice now. <laughs> Guys, this is the magic session. I'm done. I'll be glad to talk or answer questions or whatever. I've enjoyed myself, and thanks for coming down. And I see four or five old friends that I'm really glad to see that I've known most of my life. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm done now. What do you want to do? Well, if, it's okay. A, if it's okay, what we'll do is we'll probably let the children go and then we'll sit and talk about your family. Oh, okay. I mean, right. They're welcome to sit if they want to, but that's probably a little bit close, but ancient history. Well, what, what are the three tours of Canada? And I've had seven what I call big tours and then short tours like go North South Carolina and back in, go Georgia back in, you know, just what I call the uh, ham and egg dates like that. Harry, who is the greatest uh, magician presently? performing in the world. In Today? Your, your judgment. Hands down, it's David Copperfield. David Copperfield. Yes, yes, he's hands down 100%, yes. The second one, the other one, was Harry Blackstone Jr. who died yeah. in, uh, I think it was either May or June this year. Yeah. I just got a letter last night. Harry Blackstone and I had been on Channel 9 TV in 1968 together on the Jimmy Harper show, the talk show that was over there all those years. and. Uh, Jimmy Harper wrote me a nice letter saying how nice it was having Harry and I on the show together and all that, and I just found that I'd forgotten. I, I found that last night. And uh, I can't believe that's 30 years ago. Everything I remember is 25, 30, 30 40, 45 years ago, you know. That, everything I talk about is way back there, you know. That's not too unusual, this group. <laughs> I, well, I, I can't believe, I can't believe I'm 62 and I'm very lucky because I do feel like doing a show or two and I do feel like doing my fishing, you know. You're a youngster. And, uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul is about 62. Oh, is he? 83. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Brown here is uh, 84. He's shell now. 84. Oh, you, you're not 84, are you? As of 25th of April, I was. Yeah. Now, were, did you, when, when Dixie opened up here, were you in there? I was on, down on Sanford Avenue to start with. And, uh, hey, I remember that. When we built this uh, store out on 25th and French, yes, sir. I went out there. Yeah. And then I, I've been uh, not the stores they have today because I have worked 20 years. Now, you were this married to Helen. Five, 22 you married to Helen, wasn't you? Pardon? Your wife was Helen? Yeah. Shoemaker? Yeah. yeah. Found the second grade weather. Let me tell you something about that. I just learned right now. Kay Shoemaker's sister. Sister, oh, okay, okay. Bob Brown just told me something that's uh, a historical fact. He was born on April the 25th, 1913, the day that Seminole County became a county. Oh, oh mercy. Oh, yeah. Buddy Lake. Sure. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Isn't that he and Seminole County have exactly the same birthday. Well, I think we should put a photograph of him with that. I think so, too. Oh, we we could do that. I think that'd be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we could say, this guy's as old as this county. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd meet somebody that was born on oh. the exact same birthday. because. I was born the same year, see. You were born? I was born in 1913. What was your birthday? But mine was July the 30th. Uh -huh. I was a little late. I, did, I came home three months I after the county was... Uh, yeah. I'm the oldest one here. Then. You're the oldest one here. Yeah. But you should have been, the been on the county quilt. He's got to be, unless you're the first person born in Seminole County. After the county was formed. No. Yeah, I, yeah. Yes. Well, well I, have, I didn't know that myself. I don't know. I what, didn't know who I was was <laughs> what, what, uh -huh. Did you, did your mother ever tell you what time of day you were born? You were born. No. So you yeah. may be the first person uh, born in Seminole County. Now the. No, uh, I wasn't born in Seminole County. I, I wasn't was born in Seminole County. You had the same born day. Day. Okay. Pardon? Where were you born, Bob? Georgia. Ah, uh, well, that's... Where about in Georgia? <laughs> At Brexit. America. <laughs> America, so that's yeah. where Bowling Williams was. Bowling Williams was. Yeah. 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 Y
Do you remember my wife, Florence? Florence Mills? Wells. I, I didn't know your wife. Did you remember Mills? You knew Doc Wells. Yeah. You knew Doc Wells. Yeah. Oh, Doc. That was all now, I might have known your yeah. wife. And have, she uh, used to buy uh, mm -hmm. to trade there where you were. Where what year was it we lost Telling? Fifty no. Seventy three. Has it been that long? Yeah. That was Kay's sister. Yeah. yeah. Bill and I were in the second grade together. Yeah. But you're still living here, Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, uh, well, well Avenue. Yeah. Twenty three seventeen, but it's right on the north east corner what would be 24th Street if it was opened up. It's back where the Odom family used to live, back up in that field. Well, it? just... Yeah. Now, tell me, where did you inherit the King friend? Really, because of his dad. I allowed him to beat my drums with his yakking. For a listen long to, time. Listen to this. <laughs> Wait, why don't Paul beat your drums? You you play the drums? No, no. we're talking about him. He's jacking so much. Ear drums. Ear drums. Ear drums. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. He intimates, my good man, that sometimes I'm rather talkative. <laughs> yes. 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 He is rather talkative. Yeah, but where, where did your hair become French, really? He watched me grow up in this town. Uh, I see. I, my first memory of him is filling in and you're reaching up like this to hold his daddy's hand uh -huh. when you yeah. come into the market. Yeah. I tell you, he's, he's, he looks like his father to me, mm -hmm. except I don't remember Mr. Wise ever having his little white hair, but he's got the same forehead and the same uh -huh. eyes as Mr. Wise how had. Old, how old was your father when he died? 68. He died April 11, 1963. Very young man. Yeah. Right, that is young. Mother, mother and dad and I, I mean, mother and I were with him the night dad died. It was April 11th at 8 o'clock p.m. 1963. I was 28 then. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I, uh, oh, <laughs> get in the picture. <laughs> I had, uh, right here, here. You got lunch at the end of the table. Thank you. My, my mom <laughs> outlived my dad uh, by about 26 years. She died just August 2nd, 1989. And uh, my mother knew your mama. Yeah, right, yes, yes. I said, oh, I remember, I remember the old neighborhood real well. I remember Von Herbless making the Bonds candy, the Bonds peanut butter candy. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we, and so they call us over late in the afternoon sometimes, the kids would all line up to get the peanut brittle shavings and all they'd have left over. And they'd call us over for good, good candy treats. Where was that? I know, I've never heard about the peanut brittle. That's new. Oh, that's right. Right. Candy factory here in town. Von Herbalist. Von Herbalist, a Catholic family. Okay, I have to know where was the Von Herbalist peanut, peanut brittle? They did it in their own kitchen in the yeah, 40s, the right, right in their house on Myrtle Street, on Myrtle Avenue. That would be um, actually be about uh, 505 Myrtle Avenue. He's right. Yeah, close to the Camerons. Next door. <laughs> no, wait a minute. That was. Uh, yeah, they moved into the Cameron house when the Camerons left. Oh, uh -huh. That's right. And next door was the uh, the roofing, the old roofing man, Kenlaw. The Kenlaw family. Kenlaw family. Yeah. Yes, yes. And Margaret died this year. Oh, did she? She sure did. Oh, when I had my broken leg in 1948, Margaret used to come over and play cards with me, yeah. and she'd bring me Golden Key and Board and Bill can coupons yeah. to take over to to the old uh, remember the old uh, there was two sisters that had a dime store on Knight Street and in 1948 and 49 my mother and I Stein, uh, Steinmeier wasn't that their name? Oh, oh, Steinmeier about uh, Steinmeier Steinmeier that's Stoudemire. it that's Steinmeier S T O U D E that's right that's right Paul and, and Paul my mother and I Paul, Paul and Christine and Christine. Christine that's right my mother and I go over there I was on my crutches with my cast on and everything. Mm -hmm. And my mother and I would go over there and trade the milk coupons for mm -hmm. towels and dishcloths and, and good things like that. They were treasures to us, you know. Mm -hmm. And and when I broke my leg, which was October 4th, 1948, E.B. Stowe is the man that stopped and picked me up in his arms and took me home. Yes, E.B. Stowe, the artist. Yes, 
Yes, he just died at 101 or something yeah. here a couple of years ago. Yeah. Are those his paintings back there? No. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't you know. Do have any paintings anything. here in the museum? None at he all? Had, he had paintings all over the state in Holiday Inn at one time. Oh, all the Holiday Inn hobbies, uh, lobbies had uh, E.B. Stowe's paintings. We, we need one of his paintings. We've never had one done. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you who to contact first thing. Whoever's running the nursing home on Mellonville, he had a studio just three years ago. I was out there and visited with him, and he was even painting up till 100 years old because he took me down the hall to a special place. They had a special old room for him for his paintings and all, and he was doing one at 100 years old in that nursing home because I was over and saw him. I came in and, and visited with him. And uh, he and Mother and I got to know one another all those years later, by 86, 87, 88 and all, and then Mother passed away in 89, we'd go out and see him at his home out on the St. John River, right near the Osteen Bridge and all. He, he still was a wonderful storyteller, the man that would make you laugh. Yep, yep. But it, doesn't he have a picture in the museum, County Museum, that yes, great yeah. big picture? Mm -hmm. yeah, there is one We've got there. a picture out at the uh, Seminole County Museum there that uh, Mr. Stowe painted for the museum, and it's in the uh, the Seminole Indian Wars room, you know, and it depicts uh, the uh, United States Army uh, exploring the St. John's River and, uh, and holding a barge up into Lake Jesse. <coughs> that's that's the uh, oh, student, student museum. Something about the yeah, St. John's River. For well, the county, I almost said the What he did yeah. was. See, my house is right across oh, the street from the student museum. Very close to the yeah. St. John's River. I wonder if they did out there on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The palm he was a great part of this county. Well, let me let me say something about Granddad and my dad. Uh, we, 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 let's get this covered and let's just collaborate. Let's who's go the, back to the beginning. Who's the first wise to come to Sanford? Is that your grandfather? That was my grandfather who had the restaurant. Granddad opened the first restaurant here in 1907. Harry E. Wise. Where was it? Uh, dad always told me right right up from the old Pico building there, but. I know by 1912 it was on First Street there where you have in the calendar that you gave me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, he came here in 95, then he had the first restaurant open in 1907 and had a restaurant right on through several years, up and through the 20s and all. And dad came here, my dad came here in 1910 at 16. My dad was born in, in 1894. Dad came here in 1910 and he always told me, I took one look at Florida and knew this would be my home forever. He never went back to Maine or anything. Is that where he was from? Yes, Bangor, Maine. The first, his father was from Maine? Yes, yes. My granddad was from Maine and my dad was from Maine. Well, I'll bet you they were friends of Mr. Wales. What part of Maine? And uh, Bangor and Lewiston. Bangor. Bangor and Lewiston. Now, I didn't meet my grandmother on my dad's side until 1959. I was on the road with a show. And I spent a whole afternoon with my grandmother in 1959 in Bangor, Maine, and she baked me an apple pie and had me a nice, a nice steak and a baked potato and everything. And I spent four hours with her, and uh, we played the Opera House Theater in Bangor, and that's the only time I saw my grandmother was that July afternoon in 1959. Now let's talk about my mom, because my dad came here at 16 in 1910 and met my mother technically in 1930 and 31 in Lakeland. My mother was born and raised a Floridian, born and raised in Lakeland, Florida. Her name was Margaret Helen Vogler. And my dad was 18 years older than my mom, and he was managing a restaurant in Lakeland, Frank Choa's restaurant. It was a Greek restaurant there, had been there for years. And my mom went to work there as a waitress, and they met and got married and all and came here and came back to Sanford in 1932. I was born in 1934 here in Sanford. My house I'm living now is four blocks from the house I was born in. Where were you born in the, which house? On 6th Street, right off of Sanford Avenue. There's a little ivory colored building that's now a garage. Still there? It's still there, yes, yes. Mm. And it had a front porch <laughs> on it and it was up on blocks. And that was our house. That was our house. Mm. I was born there November 18, 1934, and it's right across from the Little Red Schoolhouse. In other words, it, it, the, the Little Red Schoolhouse right there, and that garage, which was that house, is right there. 
I show it to everybody I get a chance to because I can't believe the little building is still standing. Did a doctor do this? Yes. Ooh. Yes, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, Tobin or something like that. Tor. Tor. Thank you. Well, Thank you, buddy. Well, well, I forgot. I forgot, Bob. You talk so much, Bob. I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and, and uh, you don't know what you don't know what he's you know he putting up with him. He delivered me to oh, the yes, yes. Oh, the door. <laughs> and, and my dad always said he painted me out a hawk because my dad painted the doctor's house for fifty cents an hour to pay to cover the sixty dollar fee for coming to the house and follow up coming to the house and all like that. I was born in the house, you see. And uh, dad, dad painted painted the bill out with the doctor so at fifty was, cents an hour. You were born in thirty five. Thirty four. November eighteenth, thirty four. Bad time, wasn't it, buddy? Depression. Right, smack in the middle of depression. Yes. She yeah. couldn't find a job. Uh, yeah. I was my working dad. for forty cents a day there. Yeah. My dad also uh, opened uh, the shooting gallery. He had the shooting gallery here in town, and he also had the fireworks business. And he also sold his wisest four-day foot fix. And Henry Jameson remembers the shooting gallery, the wisest four-day foot fix, and, uh, and the fireworks stands and all that that dad and mother had in, uh, all in the 30s. There, you remember there it is. There's the foot fix. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there were two locations. One just over right next to where Don Knight is. And the other one's down next to the old pump house on First Street. Yes. Yes, in 1939, it was down next to the old pump house. The pump house. Yeah, it was a bar down there. Stone Cipher. Remember Mr. Stone Cipher? Ran a bartender down there for a year and year and year. Yeah. Ran the smokehouse. Yeah. And uh, I can show you both buildings where the gallery was and where our fireworks stands was. Because every 4th of July, about two weeks before the 4th, and then every Christmas and, and uh, New Year's, Mother and Dad sold fireworks. Uh, all in the 30s there, up till 1939. Um, yeah. Your mother came here uh, from Lakeland, Florida. And where did they marry you, your mother and your dad? In Lakeland. In Lakeland. In Lakeland. Yeah. He had been down there first. Well, she was born and raised there. Yeah. He went there to run this restaurant for this man, Frank yeah. Choa. Down in Lakeland. In Lakeland. They, 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 they met they there and all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Harry, for the record, uh, were there other children besides you? Oh, uh, I'm I'm an only child. Oh, I see, because I've been trying to think, but I couldn't remember a sister or brother. Yeah, yeah. Like the Baranos, there was about six or seven of them. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody told me Lois An Lois Ann Barano is still around town, but I wouldn't know if uh, I see Lois her. Lois Barano was married to a boy named Buck Metz, who played football at FSU and was a great football player. I remember, so, I remember, remember Buck? Yes, yes, I do. And he was coaching at Lyman, and I guess he's still out there. I don't know whether he's still working or not. I'd just like to sit and talk with her because when I was a boy, there's two or three things that traumatized me when I was a boy. And Richard Barano was one of them. Richard, yeah. Because we'd be playing marbles, me and Dickie Roundtree and Billy Stinson and Tommy Russell and Dickie Kinlaw. And, and Jeanette Kinlaw is still living and all. Yeah. At the, I think she still works at the bank. Yes. And, uh -huh. and uh, of all things, Richard Berno near that park to enter. I dreaded seeing him. He was the best marble shooter in this town. <laughs> Maybe all of Florida. Yeah. He'd wipe out the ring every time. I knew I loved marbles. I wasn't the world's greatest marble player, see. So I'd get pocket knives that I'd horse trade for. I'd get comic books. and go around trading all the kids in the neighborhood for marbles. Yeah. And I have right at 5,000 marbles in my collection to this day in fish aquariums. What do fish we call, aquariums. Harry, the big the big marble. Bummy rollers. We always call them bummy rollers. I thought they were the tall. Uh, they were the shooting tall. Oh. Well, we never used them to shoot. We always used a small, more agate size to shoot. But the, the, well, the, I'm you, not talking about this. Shooting. That's tall. Yeah. yeah. A line. Yeah, well, that, that was another, that yeah. was a marble game, but it was the toss to, to finally hit one and get, yeah. Do yes. you remember yes. just lagging for the line? Yeah, yeah. lagging yeah. for the line, I couldn't say it, yes. Yeah, he's things. talking about that, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that was. That. That's something. I declare, where did he make this so? At home. <laughs> I thought you knew about this. His office was in, in the living room. My earliest memory, 1930-39, is my dad and mother clanking bottles and staying up late at night. Here, here's, you want to know the story on that? It's a wonderful yeah, story. I think it is. Dad, dad uh, uh, Henry Jameson remembers dad making it. Jimmy Cowan remembered. 
Jimmy just died a couple of years ago. Yeah, he all remembered everything. And uh, he almost did, yes. And uh, but the thing is, get this now, because Dad, you talk about it a lot. Dad sold that for 75 cents a bottle. What it says. Now listen, he got the bottle, the top, the ingredients, the label and everything, and him and mother make it late at night. It cost him 13 cents to have it and make everything. And he'd go around and make the black quarters now with this. Every Friday and Saturday, he'd sell it. And he'd get a quarter down and a quarter a week. A quarter down and a quarter a week. And that means he made 12 cents. He always told me he made 12 cents on the down payment. So he had a couple loaves of bread or whatever right there. And he had it all figured down to a science. And you should say, I've got the book somewhere where, where everybody in this town owed him about $2,800 when he got out of the, got out of the book there today. Harry, to do this today, oh, Lord. you would have gone into the federal government. Oh, God. Oh, he'd get arrested it for doing that. You couldn't. $100,000 just to get the licenses and permits to make something like this, wasn't it? That's right. In and fact, it says soft corns. Uh, corns, jiggers, ringworm, athletes. In four days, I'll tell you who had a bottle in his house when he died was Elgin Myers. Had one of those bottles from 1944 or something. When he, Commercial fisherman. Yeah. Yes, old Lake Jessup. Yeah. My yeah. daughter-in-law had a, uh, to show you how the world has changed, uh, had what you would uh, call an assault uh, corn recently, and she went to a doctor in Asheville. And he said it would be $900 to remove that thing. Mm -hmm. And my son was complaining about it to one of his customers, and the customer said, go next door to Eckerd's Drugstore. <laughs> and he went next door to pay $2 and some, and removed it overnight. <laughs> <laughs> that would be close. That would be close. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was going to charge. As, as late as the, I'm going to, I'm going to go into 50s. The last, the last bottles of that mother and dad made was about 1953-54. And, and uh, dad had to go to Doc Faust. There was one of the ingredients in there that you couldn't get then. You weren't supposed to get. That he'd always bought all those years. And, and uh, Doc Faust sold him. The things he needed says, I can't let you do this anymore, but this time he had to. Slim Galloway was one of the last men to buy a bottle of that from my dad. In, four, in 47 or 48, Slim Galloway bought a bottle. Now, Henry Russell was one of the last men to buy a bottle of that from my dad and mom. Is there any alcohol in it? I don't even know, but somewhere in that house of mine is a... Yeah, I was going to ask if you had any idea what you were mixing up. Yes, I'm goodness, my mother made out the formula for me in 85 or 86, and it's in one of the drawers there somewhere in that house. It really is. Yeah. You ought to go out and see his house. If we could do this today, Harry, get a bigger bottle, and we could put it at the bottom, contains alcohol at double the price. <laughs> I bet you did. I, I was wondering whether they had alcohol well, to drink it or put it on the Yeah, who does this right here belong to? He gave it to the museum. Yeah, I was going to say, for the, for the museum, yeah. thank you. He gave us the labels. Thank you. Oh, there's a, there's, hey, you've got a bundle of labels. Get this one. A bundle of labels I brought with the original printer's wrapper on them that was from 1935. And the printer was Progress Printing at 111 Park Avenue. Yeah, Progress Printing. That's familiar. Untouched package of labels. Yep. Oh, I thought number was 249. Yeah, <laughs> I knew you'd want that, so that's that's the one. I've got a couple more there packages, but they were all messed up. Is that taking a turn? Rub on. Rub on. Rub on. Rub on. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Do, see, do not take internally. Do you see that on the bottle? I think so. Yeah, it's it's right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's poisonous in it. Sir? <laughs> yes, I was married. Uh, I wanted to touch on that because well, I have a daughter living in Jasper, Alabama. I'm asking people questions like that. <laughs> but you were married? Yes, sir. Tell my, us about it. Then. My first wife and I, Sandy Trump from Orlando, and I were married in 1965. And we had a daughter in October 9, 1970. My daughter is living in Jasper, Alabama with her husband and my granddaughter at this time. Now my daughter was born October 9, 1970, here in town at the hospital. And uh, Dr. Hardwick, you know, Dr. Hardwick was, was our family doctor and all. And uh, it took, it took Sandy and I longer to get our daughter out of Hawk 
than it did my dad painting the house for me. <laughs> it was a little more than 60 bucks on that one, see. So we did shows to get Diana out of box, see. But the thing is, uh, uh, my daughter was born October 9th, 1970. She's 27 now, my granddaughter's seven, and they live, Diana Robinson is her name now, in Jasper, Alabama. And uh, uh, then we do, we were together eight years and we bought 612 Walsh Hill Drive. The second house inside the city limits next to Miss Spence's tennis court. We lived two blocks from Charlie Morrison who lived on Valencia over there. Charlie was our neighbor. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, the, the thing is, Sandy and I divorced in July 1974 finally. And then I had a second wife. Denise Lynn Strasser of Butler, Pennsylvania. Now, I was 43 when I married Denise, and Denise was 22. And after we got together, we were talking one evening, and, and I figured out that I played her hometown when she was four years old. <laughs> I had, what are you laughing at? This is this is not funny. <laughs> so then, so then that, that that 21 years difference really makes much bigger. This over two decades, yes. So then we get talk. I keep talking about my hero on the screen was the Durango Kid, Charles Starrett, the greatest Columbia Western star in America. 17 years as the Durango Kid for Columbia. I am a walking film historian. I really am now. And, and Denise says to me, I've just learned that I played her hometown when she was four years old, see. And she says, well, this guy you're always talking about, Charles Starrett, this Durango kid, I've never heard of him. I said, Denise, a man, 17 years of Columbia Star. She says, well, I don't. So then I got thinking, and I went to one of my film books. The year Denise was born was the year Charles Starrett retired. I could, no wonder she'd never heard of him. See. That whole, that, that begins to... I began then to learn, uh, this 21 years here is serious, you know. Denise and I had two whole years together and, and a divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so I've been married twice, divorced twice, and now I'm just a lonely old wore out showman. Do you have any grandchildren? One daughter, one granddaughter, yes, yeah. with my daughter Diana in Jasper, Alabama. Oh, yes. Granddaughter is Lynn Diane, and uh, she's seven. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, you, you said you're only here part of the year. Where you have another home? Or? Well, no, I don't. Uh, I'm, I have a trailer that I pull behind the car, mm -hmm. and when I'm not in Georgia or South Carolina or Southern Alabama or somewhere, I have my trailer is parked. My trailer stays parked when I'm in and out, no, on the road or here, no, with a buddy of mine in uh, St. Augustine. It's what I like to call my road trailer. One time I was a two-trailer owner. I had a big one and my small one for the road. But one thing led to another. I sold the bigger one and now I have my road trailer, mm -hmm. which I stay in when I'm in St. Augustine. Or all I got to do is back up and in 20 minutes I'm on the road, you know. And uh, so although I'm still doing magic and shows and promotions for sponsors, I'm not right down the road like I used to be. I really. I really have slowed down. How much of a year did that used to be when you did that? Oh Lord, that, that was whole year, that right? was that was uh, nine and ten months. Yeah, and then when I got into the circus world, that then got to be six or seven, eight months at a time. You know, all by 82, 83, 84, 85, all in there, 86, even 87. But see now, the, the, the gentlemen that may not know, you told us that you had several things that you did. You did auditoriums nightclubs, I did. you eventually got into circus. I right? did. So See, at one time, this is a bone of contention among <laughs> magicians, but at one time I had the largest working magic and illusion show in the southeast. Yeah. My wife and I, Sandy and I, my first wife and I. Then I started segueing into some nightclub work. Then into the mentalism and hypnosis, which was the title for that was The Amazing Boglar, my mother's maiden name, went into colleges with that. And then in nightclubs, I was Dark Veil, the amazing Dark Veil. So for several years, I've had kind of an identity crisis. I, I, I don't know just who I am at any given time. <laughs> but when you set, when you set up a, a tour, I mean, did you, is there a circuit that automatically you get hooked into, or did you have to call every place you're going in? I've always booked and produced up? myself. I've always been my own producer. 
Now, on the, on the road to my Midnight Ghost Show and Monster Show, I had Frankenstein in person and the Mummy in person and all that. That was Dr. Jekyll and the Weird Show. That was booked out of Karsten Enterprises in Redondo Beach, California. So they represented you? They represented that. me all there in the late 63, 64, 65, 66, all in there, yes. But otherwise you had to promote yourself? And I've always, the rest of the auditorium shows, the nightclubs, the college things and all, I, I, yes. Promote yourself? Yes. What's the biggest show you ever put on? Oh, Lord, uh, Curtis Sixon Hall, Tampa, Florida. Went in there, went in there for a big show in 1968. Yep. How big? Uh, we did uh, Attendance-wise. Attendance-wise. Attendance-wise, we had about 3,000. That's a big place. Yeah, we had about 3,000. It was a JC's thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, there's a feature story telling all about me there in the Sundial. You guys remember the Sundial magazine when it was published here in town? There's a whole feature story with. Uh, with uh, Wait, pictures and everything. Yeah. 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 When was that published? Yeah. And uh, uh, in, in all the feature stories, like Schenectady, New York, and uh, even even St. Augustine, uh, the stuff over in Canada and everything, I've always given Sanford credit for being my hometown because it is. You know, I've always had the home here. Dad and mother bought that place in 1943. We moved in there May 27, 1943. Yeah. Did you ever do Las Vegas? Never did Vegas. No, sir. No, sir. I've got two friends playing out there right now. I've got a son playing out there. Have you? Oh, what's well, he doing? Well, uh, Vince Carman, the magician from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, is out there. And Ty Limley, who was the last singer for Guy Lombardo's band. Oh, well, he and I worked dates around here as late as 78 and 79 and all. I even played the flea market here in 1978 when it was out there where when Dixie is now. I couldn't believe it. I go out there to play the date, and there's Ty Limley who had just come down from New York after having. I saw him on on 1977 New Year's Eve night. Mother and I are watching Ty Limley sing with Guy Lombardo. I go out there three weeks later to play the flea market, and there's Ty Limley appearing with me out there at the flea market right here in Zambard. I couldn't believe it. Was that on 25th Street? Uh, uh, 13th. The flea market was on 13th then. The flea market was on 13th Street, where, uh, where, where Wynn Dixie is now. Yeah. Right there. You remember on those, I know, you mean the, the farmer's market? No, the flea market. Yeah, well, the flea market for years there. Yeah. Well, I don't think anybody's ever mentioned the flea market. Yeah, 13th Street. 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 13th Street.
Yeah, that would be good. Uh, did uh, you bring that down? Yeah. That'd be a Cochran real well. Mr. Cochran had a store on First Street uh, and on Stratford Avenue. I used, I, I've worked around there occasionally. Also, Stevens. Remember S&S? Good. Good. He good. wanted me to go to work for him. I went on Saturday morning at 6 o'clock and I worked until about 7 or 8 that evening and sent me down on Saturday. Did y'all ever come across a picture to uh, Mr. Ralph's store, my daddy's store, or in this grocery, which was just behind I'm there? Draw a picture here. Thing. That's where Red Barber worked for me. No. Yeah, Red Barber. I can't. Uh, I'm trying to find that thing. Harry, do you remember Lodge's Grocery? Oh, yes. <laughs> See, Lodge's Grocery back right against our property. <laughs> Turner Lodge's back door yeah. opened out over our property by about a foot there. You know, we wouldn't have, my family wouldn't have made it to the depression that we had in the Lodge's Grocery. Well, we get, we yeah, remember Turner again. Lodge and jo uh, Jackson yeah, Lodge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. Ms. Lodge was a fine lady, too. Oh, they were great people. Yeah. Yeah. See, they were they Thank were there. You. They were. Well, now, Harry, are you going to keep going and you work, or are you anywhere near retirement? I'm. I'm working. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm. Although I'm not down the road like you, I used to be. You're in good health. I'm, I seem to be. I'm. I'm That's very good. lucky. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, I've got. To, as I say, I can still do a show and still fish. Yeah. So I just want to go as long as I can. You know. I'm, oh, of course. I'm, I'm not going to sit and stagnate. Do it, I'm, I'm not going to sit and stagnate. I don't want to do that. No. I don't for that. Uh, I, uh, I've, had, I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to uh, to do my thing all these years. Have you been across the street to the uh, to the Sanford the school museum? Oh yes, that's right across the street from our house. Yes. Mother and I enjoyed yeah, it. I See, Kenny it. Eccles is a very dear friend. Yeah, he was. And Kenny was curator over there that's and all. Right. And uh, they got a fine program. I have been over there. I donated my Pioneer Marbles to that museum. He was asking me about my marble collection all, and I had 22 clay marbles that I had found in the neighborhood in the 40s, mm -hmm. in our yard, in Stinson's yard, and right there in that park. I had 22 clay marbles from the turn of the century to donate to that museum, and I have the letter there in the house from Kenny thanking Mother and I for donating the clay marbles and all to the museum. Yeah. Have you seen Kenny lately? Yes, uh, today is what? I saw him the day before yesterday at the Colonial Room. I saw him at a distance Sunday in church. I understand he's, is he all right? Uh, he's doing pretty good now. He's doing hey, pretty good now. He broke his collarbone. Yeah. Uh, How many of the Eccles families there? I think, Kenny? I think Kenny's it. Kenny and Pete's Pete. gone. And Elmer Roy Pete is gone. gone. Yeah. Elmer's gone. Doug's Doug's gone. Doug's gone. Doug's gone. Doug's gone. Carl Doug's gone. Douglas is gone. Mm -hmm. Carl? Yeah. Doug was like in Mike Huh? Doug was in Mike Yeah. I'd he like was to a handsome class. fellow, wasn't he? Yeah. Boy, he, he really played he that too well. Now, wh how about the girls? I never knew any of the girls, but Evelyn. Evelyn, uh, is Evelyn she, and uh, is she uh, alive? Magnam's wife, uh, remember her? Yeah. Evelyn. Evelyn. Didn't she pass? Uh, Evelyn, red, we call, Evelyn was written and uh, there was... Uh, what was McNabb's wife's name? I'm, I'm trying to... Did she die? Yeah. yeah. She just died a couple of years That's ago in the collector. Yeah. yeah. See, I called Barbara. Uh, Barbara is... Barbara. In, Barbara's yeah. in Palatka. That's Bobby right. and Zeke's sister, Barbara. Yes. They live right on the I river. They live on the St. John's River. Lucille. 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 Lucille McNabb. Right. Right. It comes out slowly. Yeah. <laughs> Don't see. Well... Uh, boy, when it gets where it won't come out, then you then you're in trouble. <laughs> so it, it looks like it's Evelyn and Kenny are the only two left. It was Carl, you know, the oldest one. Because what has a tree service? Because uh, Eccles has a tree service that some can yeah. some. Yeah, now that's so. Uh, that's Pete. that's uh, That was Pete's. Uh, Pete's boy. boy. Yeah. I, I saw him a year or two ago. He did some work for me. And he he just worked for me too. All right. Yeah. Now Pete's wife, Mary Knight Peters, is still alive. <coughs> she graduated my class, but not in good health. One of the girls married a boy in Raleigh, because I rode back with their sister from State many, many best one year. Many Bess. Yeah. Is she alive? Huh? Is she alive? I don't think so. 
haven't heard about anything about it in a long time. You remember the old uh, mattress factory down there on 13th and Sanford yeah. Avenue? Yeah. So, so long. And then Roy uh, took it over and moved it to Orlando. Yeah. Well, it was in he Daytona was at one time, too. Huh? It was in Daytona at one time, yeah, too. It was, that's right. Yeah. Roy was a, was a CPA, too. And their slogan was, mattress company was, sleep on the nickels. <laughs> <laughs> I used to yep. think that was cute. That was some family. Dad and I, when we were painting houses together in the 50s, Dad and I would go to Eccles Mattress Shop and get the old mattress tickings and all, Good. and wash them out and hang them on the line and all to sun out. Oh, we used those for our drop clothes yeah. from the from the Echo. Yes, I'm not <coughs> kidding you. We used. I still got one or two of those old mattress tickings in the lawn house, as a matter of fact. Weren't they the on the 13th tickings. and Sanford? Yeah, yeah. And then they moved way down somewhere on the 17th. <laughs> yeah, they moved right, yeah. right close. Yes, sir. That, that's what I mean. On the left-hand side, going south. The earliest memory I had of the Eccles family was when I was out on the farm with my dad and in Lake Monroe. And the Eccles lived down on West First Street, you know, where the old Eccles house was. Yeah. You know, Next they to the Wiggums. Years, lived out there for years. And uh, they had bicycles. And uh, I used to walk out to their house so I could ride their bicycles. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I saw the old uh, man there was one of the nicest people. Oh, yeah. Still. I remember him. Yeah, I remember he was, Miss Eccles. He was just nice. There's and, something. Uh, he's a hard working man. He, he was on that uh, mattress factory out there. And uh, if somebody came in there and he knew they couldn't afford it, they still got a mattress. Now, whether they paid him later or yeah. they never paid him, it didn't seem to influence him. I like to say something about Kenny, Kenny, they deserved. Kenny Eccles, when he was in the school system here, Kenny Eccles would hire my, my magic show at a couple of schools he was at and all. He really would do that. And not only that, when my mother died in 1989, Kenny Eccles took hours with me to go over paperwork and insurance stuff and made phone calls and wrote letters. I was a wreck. Yeah. Kenny Eccles mm -hmm. saw me through that and did that paperwork for me on three different occasions. He's he a was, good man. He was a lifesaver, yes. He's yes. a good man. Yes. Kenny Eccles has always been a friend of the wisest. Yeah. Yes. What was the name of Kenny's wife? I, I, I can't say it. I you couldn't you say it. Now. Yeah. She was a sweet little gal. Buddy, uh, no. talk about the Eccles, Pete Eccles, and I played uh, baseball, and um, I, I used to pitch in the Lions Club, Mr. Carl Brand, you know, and I, we won that a couple of years, and then I played American Legion, and I could throw. I didn't have a lot of speed or anything, but I learned to throw a roundhouse curve. I mean, it was a roundhouse curve. And all the boys uh, that would get up to bat that were right-handed, they couldn't hit the damn lane. And Pete, Pete would swing at that ball. And they said, it cuss a blue streak, and I'd throw it the road. And like that, and I didn't work on the left-handers. John Morgan and Fred Dyson and all these boys that were left-handed, they learned to wait on that thing. They didn't have any speed. <laughs> They learned to wait on that thing till it curved over the plate at, at grammar school and right over the trees into the front yard of your house. John hit more than one off of me and Fred Dyson too. You remember the trees out there? Yep. And they get in the street and bounce up there in your yep. yard. Yep. But uh, Pete couldn't, he couldn't hit that roundhouse curve to see it. So. <laughs> yeah. I had, he could get mad too, buddy, I'm telling you. He uh, had cancer the same time Herbie did, and he called me about Herbie. He was worried about her when he had cancer himself. Now, how about Tickle? Tickle? That's uh, Elmer. Elmer. Uh, well, I, I, uh, Tickle was had a grocery store across the street here at Enterprise for a long time. Yeah. yeah. He, I remember Tickle. He's gone. Douglas and Elmer were the older boys, and then there was Tickle and Roy, and then there was Pete and Kenny. 
Is there somebody else? And there was three girls. Carl was the oldest. Yeah. Carl was the oldest. So there were seven boys and three girls. There's ten people in that family. Now all the Ograms are gone, exception of Glenn. That's eight. And all the Higginses are gone. Uh, all of them are gone? All the Higginses are gone. And all the Ograms, except Glenn, is still alive. He's down in somewhere in the middle part of the state. But most of our families, the large families, are all gone. Uh, yeah, but damn them, they're spading in there. Odom didn't run for them. John Braden. 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 What, what caused his death? Uh, he had emphysema. Uh, Brady, like a lot of boys, started smoke, smoking heavy, real young. And see, nobody told us in our generation you know, that that was, that was... I smoked and time I used to pick up... <laughs> Some uh, right. might have thrown out a cigarette butt like that. Lord, Well, Braley, uh, and my brother Julian were very close all through the years, and he was close to Bowley Williams Jr. And I went down, John Morgan, and I went down to the visitation for Braley in Orlando, and I went. They had everybody filed by Brady's casket there, and his widow was standing there. And I, I, uh, I had a lot of experiences with Brady, but I, I, I hugged her and I said, Brady and my brother Julian are already in an argument up in heaven somewhere about something having to do with sports. <laughs> and I said, unless I miss my guess, Bowley's trying to get in the argument too, and she just filed. <laughs> Brady was something. I saw him at the cemetery, buddy, about about six months before he died. I was out there working on my lot, and this great big old long Cadillac with black men driving turned in the cemetery. And it went all around real slow. And it came up behind my car. Now our lot is right next to the old ones. Mr. Oldham and my daddy buried side by side. Well, this black man started looking about 40 yards away, and I collared at him. I said, which one are you looking for? He said, the open lot. And I said, well, it's right here. And all of a sudden, this old, old man, uh, I knew with Braley, buddy, he was a shadow of himself. Yeah. He had an old cap pulled down. He was on oxygen full time. And I walked over to the car and got as far as here to the door. And I said, is that you, Brady? And he said, yeah. Is, are, is that you, Doug? I said, yeah. And we went over there and hugged each other. And he said, show me where Mom and Daddy are. And so I took his arm and took him over there. And uh, we talked for an hour and a half. I'll see Braley talk for an hour and a half. You know how he was oh, yeah. about Warren, who's right there. I'll be right next to Warren. And both of the girls were there. And you remember Ms. Oldham? Of course you were. And uh, I said, what are you going to do? He said, I want to I wanna put a considerable... He told me he had sold an $11 million piece of property and got this commission. And he wanted to put this money in the city to guarantee perpetual care of that lot. He's going to be, he was buried in Orlando. And I said, Brady, you don't have to do that. The city's got a contract with a firm in, in uh, Longwood who are doing a beautiful job out here. They water your lot and my lot and everybody's lot around here. Two <coughs> three times a week, fertilize three times a year, mow it. He said, no, I want to, I want to be sure it's taken care of it. He said, no. He said, I went, and, and this colored man was a fellow named Roosevelt. He said, I've already paid Roosevelt here to take care of all this out here. And uh, he said he's going down to City Hall. But he didn't need to do that. But uh, Braley, uh, he was funny. He said, Doug, you know the only thing important in this world is love. And I said, yeah, I knew that, Braley. And as we would talk along, somebody's name would be mentioned, and he'd say, who? And I'd say, 
He's a he's no good. He's a sorry crook if I ever want it. About the fifth time that helped, I said, Brayley, we started out here, you telling me about the importance of love, and every time we talk about somebody, you call it me the crook. <laughs> he was funny. But I felt I felt close to old old Brayley. He I think was one of a yes. kind. Yes, yes. You could be it you could be with this boy in his political career nine times in a row. I mean nine times in a row you could go with him. The tenth time you'd say, Brayley, I, I, I don't see it quite that way. And you were a no good son of a Oh, yeah. I but remember. For life. I remember when Dad and I were painting houses in the Berry over there. We did, uh, we did a lot of work for Miller's Acres and Plantation Estates. Sure. And all that over there. And Theo Stiles was the man that come and talked that into going and talking to Bill Miller in 1950 and getting that work over there. Mm. I mean, you probably remember Theo Stiles. Yeah. And, uh, well, Theo Stiles and my dad, A.W. Doc Wise, and uh, the Bill Jameson, Henry Jameson's dad, mm -hmm. and Sid Richard were all in the First World War together, yes. the First Florida Rainbow Division. Mm -hmm. Yep, so they were all tight buddies, all tight buddies. And uh, uh, we, we were over there, Bradley Odom, 51, 52, he'd come around with his sound truck when he was running for office and all. He'd come around with his sound truck over there in DeBerry and all, and stop and talk to us a minute and all. We always kind of liked Bradley, yeah. Oh yeah, if Bradley had had a little bit more uh, tolerance, you, you, everybody can't see everything in life. And you were either with him or you were against him. And you could be with him nine times in a row, yeah. and the tenth time say, well Bradley, I don't quite see it that way. And you were no good <laughs> Who so was that he ran against, and they said he talked about him so much that when you got rid of the book, Braley, was it Dan McCarthy? Or? Yeah, he, Braley gave the uh, governorship away really in 1954. Now Dan McCarthy beat him a switch of 15,000 votes in 1952, and Braley would have been governor. Dan got 345,000 and Braley got 315,000. He almost became governor. Then your mom McCarty well, died you know, nine months course, after. You know, everybody, uh, no, I don't think everybody, but most everybody was supporting or keeping quiet. Well, Braley, when he was running. Braley always life. said if he could have 60% with him, you know, he said he didn't give a hoot about the other forty percent. I said, Brady, that's crazy. They they might not vote for you this time, but you treat them know. right, they may be with you the next time. Yeah. Last time. Anyway, in fifty four, uh, he started out when Charlie Johns became acting governor. Brady was ahead of the polls. He had Governor Johns and Roy Collins got in the race and, and Brady was still number one. Then he made a terrible mistake. He started running, calling John's every name in the book, and he started running the Roy Collins down, who had done more for education than any governor. Yeah, I remember Collins. And he went he all the way to third place. He could have been governor if he'd have walked around and acted like. I told him that. I said, Brady, leave him alone. Act like you're the only one in the race, and act like governor. He could. It's just like that conversation you told my dad out to the cemetery. He, he knew that when he got out there and it, it got all pumped up, all of that was, it, it was gone. He yeah. told this Roosevelt, the colored fellow that day, he said, I've known that this here all of his life. He's a pretty good boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, how old was Brady? Brady was uh, 70. Four when he died, same as Julius. The last time I saw Brayley was when we buried my brother in Orlando. He was brother's friend. Yeah. Uh, uh, I didn't know then that there was anything wrong with him. I didn't. He was in the car right next to me, and I didn't get out. He, uh, he you know, he never drank him. coffee. He drank Coca Colas all of his life for lunch, uh, for breakfast. When he got up the first thing in the morning, Brayley did was lit a cigarette and opened a Coca-Cola. And he could never say radio. He said he was going on radio and give him hell. <laughs> yeah. Did you know Brayley? Yeah. Is, is that thing off there? Is that thing off right there? 
Doug, I mentioned Russell. He said Russell was a crook, Doug. And I said, Brady, listen, that's your brother. And, and, and Russell was accepted the Lord, was a faithful up here at the First Baptist Church deacon. He said, I don't know anything about all that. He was a crook. <laughs> No, Boy, I mean, uh, uh, Brady could not be wrong. That's right. He would That's not have some mean. excuse for anything he said, yeah. he even would. though he knew yeah. he was wrong. Uh, he could. He was, was, a, he was, was, he was the worst you see the I ever saw. <laughs> Did you know uh, we had his biography out at the museum? Right yeah, in fact, one day I read it out there. You, you uh, know it out there. A fellow from uh, University of Central Florida wrote it, and I, had, I thought the editorial the Sentinel wrote on Braley was wonderful. Braley, uh, he was just, in fact, the whole bunch uh, were different, you know. The whole crowd. But he, had, had, he had charisma. Uh, if he could uh, uh, combine some uh, better qualities and his own personal behavior with uh, his charisma, he, he could have made governor. He could have won that second time. And, and, uh, he, he, did, he, he just said, uh, my, you, my Florence, Florence said he did vote for Brayley. <laughs> she never did vote for him because he was always giving me a fit, see, and everybody else. And he told me, he said, how come you run around with Mike Cleveland? I said, well, Lord of mercy. <laughs> Mike, I, I've known Mike. We went to the same place school. He said, he's not the same kind of fellow you are, Douglas. And I, was, I said, well, I don't know anything about that. And, but he liked bowling. And they fell out when they were in their 50s. And I felt bad about it. And I thought, I told Florence, I said, I'm going to try to get them back together. So I went to see Bowley. And I said, Bowley, it's not right for you and Brady to be uh, out like that, spoken for two or three years. He said, Doug, Brady old is crazy as he'd be. He's just plain crazy. You can't do nothing. Well, I went to see Brady, and that's what he said. Bowley's crazy, Doug. <laughs> well, I tell you, Bowley was one of these hard-headed. Oh, yeah. Once time. he got something planted. Yeah. But the difference was you could you could, oh, you could talk to him. You yeah. could you him. could raise your voice at Bowley and come back at him and he'd back off. Braley wouldn't back off. He wanna physically <laughs> get in the fist fight. <laughs> no belligerent, yeah. <laughs> but all these old family stuff. I I'm so glad they got you down here, Harry. I'm, I'm going to leave you guys talking and go I back there with Alicia. Too. I've got, well, I've brought pictures here that, that i got to go over with her because she don't know what they are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. You go ahead here. Yeah. Paul, nice to see you, and I'll see you later. Yeah. Well, you going to take off? I'll, I'm right going right. to go in about two weeks back to Asheville for a while. Then I'll be home. Harry, we'll enjoy it. Thank you. Well, Good to see you again, buddy. Nice to you. this is so far. I photographed so them make, to make negatives, so and then I just made photocopies so I can keep track of what's going on. Good, I put together the Okay, all right, because I can put this on. These are all the same Now this is 53. These are 53. i make sure I get the dates right on these things. So okay. this was, no, this was 63. Should be 63. And Houlihan had me down for a special March of Dimes thing. This was actually for a special March of Dimes thing at the Ritz Theater. And that was at the Ritz also. Yes, it was. I thought these are great. Okay. Right, so that's, that's that batch. And I photographed all of those. Okay. 
Okay, so now these are look like they're much older. Those are much older. Halloween 1953. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Those, those guys are the, the second professional date of my career. Right okay, here. this is what you were telling us about. Yeah. So these are really important photographs and these are really good. Yeah. And that's all Henry Jameson also. Okay, these are Henry so, Jameson. Yes, yes. Henry was my early chronicler for, for my career. But your arteries clear and all that. And when okay, these are wonderful. I'm just copying these. These are. Is it, so this is the stage of the ribs, right here? Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. This is the edge of what I'm seeing here? Yes. Yeah. Well, what I'm wondering, they just took down the curtain. I'm got it together, got up and said, well, I'll see y'all. I'm going out to Angels. Oh, God, that yeah. curtain had been there for years. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a different stone. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my Oh, you're driving blindfolded.